Hello, and welcome to our thought-provoking podcast with myself, actor, writer, director and deep thinker, Libby MacArthur, counsellor, life coach and all-round mountain man, Ross Hislop, and compassionate, strong advocate for women, motivational speaker and broadcaster, Anne Hughes. In this series of podcasts, we talk about the things that we hardly ever talk about. We attempt to unpack the obvious, important, enormous life topics, questions and controversial issues that no one hardly ever mentions or wants to discuss. Because it makes, well, at least some of us, feel a tad uncomfortable. Nothing here is overlooked. This is The Elephant in the Room. In this week's podcast, we attempted to unpick just what exactly unconscious bias is and how does it affect us. Human beings are hardwired to make intuitive decisions about other people. We go about our daily lives making unconscious judgments that affect our attitudes and behaviours towards others. But what Ross, Anne and myself try to understand is, when does this bias become a problem and something that's used to exclude others? So we started off by getting a watertight definition on what exactly unconscious bias is, and we took it from there. Have a listen. Unconscious bias. Hmm. It's bursting my nut. I don't understand what it is. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, and here's the first thing. You know how that we were on TV now, if you're looking at adverts or you're looking at dramas, all of a sudden there's a really healthy mix of different shades of skin colour. And all of a sudden you realise they've been missing. missing. Not they are absent from our media. Oh my God, you, know, mm. you just think, it never occurred to me that there were any black families doing Tesco adverts. That they, you know, it's only now that I, I look at all these products being sold by a whole range of folk on the spectrum of different skin colour that I go, oh my goodness, it was predominantly white. But there's the thing, it's no, it's not just about colour either, isn't it? It's about so much stuff and I will, I do want to kick us off with a tiny wee bit of a definition that an unconscious bias affects your behaviour or decisions without you realising it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so therefore in that conversation this week, I me trying to unpick what are my unconscious biases... And it was funny, Gary said to me the other day, no, Anne, I think that's a conscious bias. <laughs> because he's like, that's no, that's, that is deliberate. You mean it when you don't like the people. Um, whatever group <laughs> or setting that may be in. Yeah. That we have. And you're lot, very aware of that. I'm very aware of that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And because so much of this unconscious bias stuff, it's like in an interview situation. And I would literally always go for a woman and always go for an underdog. Yeah. So my unconscious bias would always probably take me if a black woman's in the interview, then that's probably who I'm getting the job to sure. because I always want to help the people that are the underdogs. I know. But that actually turns out as a, maybe a conscious bias. Indeed. I indeed. don't know. I don't know. I was laughing at myself thinking, right, what's the opposite of an unconscious bias? A conscious bias? And yes. then I thought, no, propaganda, that's the opposite of an unconscious <laughs> bias. When it's not just, and you know, there's malice intent involved, you know? Uh-huh. So, I mean, I think we are talking about things that take us unawares. You know, we kind of go, oh, that's a ready. Oh, that's a pure ready. I never even realised. Ah. My first thought was that time when a pal of mine had arranged to meet another pal was three of us going out for a drink and we were going to meet in Central Station and it happened to be an old film game so me and my pal Mary Dockery were standing bemoaning the the discrimination all that kind of sense of the sectarian old film kind of stuff you know we were going poor old Glasgow's get this and it's a terrible thing for it and that's awful and stuff and Mary smoked like a lump and, and, I, and we were standing there and in those days she was smoking so we were standing at Central Station smoking away and a guy came along with you know the Union Jack is a cape and mm. he's wee blue you know, shirt on, he's like, got a light in, you got a light in. And we were as cold as anything. And we were like, I need bother. Hi, there you go, there's your light, son. Hi, you're welcome. Cheerio, stony faced. Next wee guy comes up, green and white hoops. We're like, hiya, hiya. Would you want a light? What was the, what was the score? You know, kind of, and it was it was only when the wee Celtic supporter went away that we both looked at each other as laps, Tims, and went, oh my God. We, we, one minute we're bemoaning sectarianism, next thing we're, Attitude towards those two boys were completely And yet different. they were just the same guy. Same wee guy. Oh, you know, wow. and you just have, put I... those two wee guys mm. in the terraces. Really? Put those right. wee guys in the terraces. You don't even know their first names. You don't even know where they live, what they do, what their grannies are like, anything. And you watch them want to punch lumps at each other. Aye. Do you know what I mean? And you go, God, you guys know nothing about each other. Except well, you're on a different team. I know. Right. So 
on that, you're talking about people. And I became aware of unconscious bias probably about 20 years ago. I had a chocolate Doberman, right? Mm -hmm. Big, ferocious, hefty, muscular beast. And folk used to come up, oh, what a lovely dog. And I would say, oh, it's a Doberman. And they would have a wee step back. But there wasn't really any bias towards that dog because there weren't a lot of them about. I then got a black Doberman. And then I started to notice that people used to cross the street. And what I started to notice that when people used to cross the street, the Doberman would notice that people were starting to cross the street away from it. And I started to think, I wonder if the animal is perceiving the unconscious bias or fear response that it's got about Doberman that's been set up in them because Dobermans are ferocious dogs. And the Doberman starts to act out in a ferocious way because of the way that people are perceiving them. Now, you mentioned about supporters. Now, you've then just projected an unconscious bias onto that person and that person is going to succumb to your projection. That's not your responsibility, Libby. But it's their responsibility if they act it out. How many people are acting in a particular way because of the projections of our unconscious bias that we are placing upon them? I absolutely. Do you know it's actually a fact that black animals get left behind? You know, shelters, dogs and cats that are black are the last to get picked up. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that you know that whole notion of you know there's something kind of demonic in the black. Oh, well, dog, there's something, you know, kind of, it's like, you know, black, it's another yeah. word for depression, isn't it? The black yeah. dog visit. Black dog. But people, you know, I've got an unconscious bias. This person's innocent. My unconscious bias gets invisibly projected out into the field onto them and they catch it. And then they start to act out in a manner that's going to fulfil my internal narrative. So how much are we all caught in an entanglement around about this invisible, unspoken <laughs> elephant of unconscious biases? I mean, are any is up for owning an unconscious bias? Oh, I get loads of them. So Aye. let's let's each let's all pick one. Uh -huh. Let's all pick just the one. Well, I suppose for me it would be privately educated. You know, lives in Surrey. Um, sense of entitlement, you know. I just think, you know, you're just an ignoramus. You know, I would just think, you know, clever, stupid, you know, no matter whatever degrees you've got, as far as I'm concerned, you're just completely, you know, you've got no real wisdom, you've got no real sense. For me, it looks, you know, who who's in leadership at the moment in terms of our country? Boris Johnson. I see the guy as an absolute twat, mm. but a really seriously dangerous one because of the amount of power that he can wield, you know. So, yeah, I have a big unconscious bias towards folk who have been privately educated and have money. I, I, I just don't think they're fully-fledged human beings. But you, Ross? Oh, there's one comes to mind, but there's, I've, got, I've got loads. I've got a <laughs> library, a catalogue of unconscious biases. <laughs> but in February, I met a girl. She became a friend, and Natalie, and she jumped out of the car. We were going to hike a mountain at 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter, and she jumped out, and she was stereotypical, blonde hair, blue eyes, eyelashes, painted nails, you know, and looked like a dolly bird, shall we say. And the minute she jumped out the car, I watched my brain go, oh, here we go. How much is she going to hold us up? And in actual fact, I walked the whole walk with her. She's got the heart of gold. She's got the heart of a lion. She's got so much courage. She's had so much bravery in her life. And she's just got the heart of gold. She's an absolute superstar. But that very first seeing her, how I projected into that it was going to be a completely different way. Mm -hmm. The dolly bird. I know, and horrible. she wouldn't be able to climb. <laughs> She's not going to be able to climb. She, she, a, she bet all the boys. <laughs> uh, I suppose as a female, and the, the opposite of the dolly bird would be, you know, the macho guy, the guy that's covered in tattoos, you know, the guy that's... Tattoos. Up, you know, the guy that's sort of built up and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be, I would assume that he's going to be, you know, Neanderthal. Aye. I think that mine's is probably, well, I could generically say it's men, but I won't be that cruel because I do obviously <laughs> have a husband and a son and male friends, you know. But I think it's like middle class, middle age men in grey suits with grey hair and grey attitudes. <sighs> and like, and I know that I scare the fuck out of them <laughs> because quite honestly, you're right, I don't know what I'm going to say next either. But the fact that Right, if I could walk into a room with somebody, say an opportunity come up and I walked into a room with somebody and that's what they look like, I'm already like in the back state because now I'm like, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get on with him. 
So where's the point? Is even wasting our time, kidding on? Yeah. So it's always but how bad do you othering. know that just because he doesn't dress well and his head nature yeah. has turned his head a different colour sure. does not mean that I'm not going to go on with this guy? But I would automatically assume I was. Sure. And we are talking about bad othering here, aren't we? We're talking about our, our projections, and you know, and what are these assumptions? And the phrase that sums it up for me that the unconscious bias is when we look at somebody and we go, "Oh, it's a shame for me, but it's all right for you." And maybe when I'm actually doing unconscious bias, there's a bit of me that thinks they've got it too easy. They, they've got, you know, the sense of entitlement comes up big in my head. That idea of that's something I cannot bear is somebody with a sense of entitlement. You know, if somebody said to me, listen, this guy's a, a multimillionaire, this guy's a billionaire, other folk might think, very talented, very clever, astute, able. I just would think, who have you ripped off? <laughs> you know, who, who's... You don't who's... become a billionaire without exploiting people, as my daughter tells me. would be my, <laughs> be my bias exactly. straight away, you know. But there's that affinity bias in there, and I think I've definitely got that, where mm-hmm. you have gravitate towards people that are similar to you. So if I knew I was meeting somebody and they grew up in an area similar to me, so probably didn't have a lot, and sort of I grew up in that very waste of Scotland working class, probably Catholic sort of a background, I assume I'm going to go on with this person. Sure. I do, I just automatically assume. I've got a great with them, we're just the same. Bye. That Bye. doesn't always work out for it me, obviously. It, it doesn't always work <laughs> Absolutely. I've got an unconscious bias against people that are homophobic I think when you said I got on with them the minute I hear somebody that's kind of starts banging their opinions around about sexuality I just go right after them and they're probably really decent people no they're no <laughs> um, they're no but unconscious you know something that has changed that I've had to work at and that was an unconscious conditioning was that I was brought up in a family uh, I was brought up my single parent with my mother and my two sisters so I naturally gravitated mere towards the company of women. I found it quite difficult to be around men because there was perhaps less of a variety of men in the 80s or early 90s than there is now. And it's only now in my late 40s that I have got really good male friends because the type of male, the stereotypical, goes to the club, plays darts, plays pools, into football. That's never been my kind of guy. So I've got, I had more of an unconscious bias towards those kind of men because they weren't in my house. They weren't, you know, my mum and my sisters didn't watch football, know that women can't, eh? but, you know, they were into fashion and art and fabrics and my mum was a hairdresser. And um, it's only been in, my, in the last sort of 10 years that I can say that I've formed really good relationships with men. And that was an unconscious bias. Well, if we turned it on its head, Mm. because I've got one for this, and said, have people had unconscious bias towards us? I think. Oh, for sure. Has men had unconscious bias towards women? No, 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 no. Just has anybody had an unconscious bias towards me? Have I had an experience of thinking they think they know who I am, but they don't? Absolutely. So I think, and I get, this is my shit that some of my pals tell me to stop harping on about. But as a working class woman, I think that sometimes I go into situations and people think they know who I am and they can tell a story about me. And I sort of, I know when this isn't a fight worth having with you because you think you know who I am. You maybe don't. And it's almost like they struggle to marry up, especially in a work environment. What words I'm talking about, what intellect I'm bringing, what wisdom I'm bringing to the situation, a lot of strategic work that I do. But they can't, like, especially really middle class people, can they marry it up? And in a piece of work I was doing recently, one day, I'd been there for quite a long time, and a woman said to me when we were talking about somebody that was underperforming, but you are quite intimidating, Anne. And I was like, well, granted, I probably could be if I wanted to be, I'll grant you that, but never once have I been intimidating here. And that, she was very posh London. That was all based on me having a Glasgow accent. Absolutely. 100% Absolutely. it was. Then I found out she went to uni in Glasgow. So obviously a big Glasgow woman intimidated mm. her a mm. few times. Yep. And she just thought every Glaswegian is intimidating. But she was now projecting that. Absolutely. And yes, yes, and, yes, and, and that's what we were talking. If you, then, if you then act out that projection, that's your responsibility. But then also feeds into their unconscious bias, that then you allow them to be right. Mm. Well, let me explain that a wee bit better. So if I walk into a room and some, I feel the projection of another person's unconscious bias onto me and I get a sense they don't like me, right? 
and then I start to react or indeed respond to their unconscious bias, well, I'm only feeding into making them right. But if I keep true to myself and I hold myself, that can turn because I'm not acting at the projection. They might think, oh, actually, he's not what I expected him to be. Yeah. And the tables can turn. But that's something that's had to be learned because a lot of people see that somebody doesn't like you and then you just start playing into their hands by being a wido or a wee bit sure. aggressive or a wee bit quick to respond or react to them. And I then there's no healing. <laughs> my response yeah. with that is, well, you're lucky you've only, you can only meet me on Zoom, Hen, because, oh my God, if you met me in person, would I fully gear up the intimidating? <laughs> you're damn right about no. So, so maybe there's what you're saying then, Ross, is that thing of like, don't, don't do that, Anne. And exactly. Maybe it's like, hold no, no, back. Do the and, opposite. And, yeah, can it like literally be counterintuitive? And the one that I got with me, which was quite good fun, was... Um, Eddie Mayer on the radio. So before Fred McCauley would do BBC Scotland every morning, I used to go with Eddie Mayer on a Wednesday morning and my job was just to talk to folk. So I'd be talking exactly the way I'm talking now, you know, this kind of accent, Scottish BBC radio, and Mary would phone for Aberdeen. I'd go, well, Mary, the thing about what you're saying is... So it was a kind of problem-solving slot kind of thing and stuff, and Eddie Mayer was on it with me, and it was great fun. And anyway, the next thing, someone comes on, and he literally said... Girl on the radio, which can't even speak the Queen's goddamn English. What's the BBC coming to us? And no one goes this well not to in charge. What's going on? She can't do. No. We can't have people like her speaking on the radio. You know. Anyway, so of course Eddie Mears, Kelly and I'm still laughing, and I'm, my bottle's crashed. I've completely feel as if the Parky whistle's gone. The big shepherd crooks on my neck. The big hand on the shoulder, as if he, you know, stole the chicken for the the supermarket. I literally my bottom fell out my world, and I thought. God, he's right. I can't be on the radio talking like this, you know? So anyway, I, I got it together. Eddie was killing himself laughing, you know, and I was going, you speak, you speak, you know, miming, you speak next to me. He was like, no, 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 you speak, miming. Anyway, eventually, I, his name is John Reed, this guy, and eventually I said, listen, John, you obviously can speak the Queen's God, I'm English. So I've spoke to Eddie and he says it's okay if you come on and take this slot next Wednesday. So because, you know, but just before we get that organised, I'm speaking a dialect and this is BBC Scotland and there's lots of different dialects and believe it or not, John, you've got one. You've actually got an accent and do you know what's really weird? See your accent. Oh, I've got a whole story about that. I've got a whole story about the marbles in your mouth. Mouth Scottish for mouth. Anyway, end of that story was that the, the lines were jammed and it was people from Norway and Sweden all phoning in to say, we love an accent. We love to hear uh, our accent. Because there was all this stuff about Alex Scott, as it she's mm. called, the BBC presenter on just like recently and the during the Olympics in Tokyo, and some lord other I such and who he was. I don't remember his name. I only remember Alex's name. <laughs> and um, he had complained about the fact that she wasn't using her G's, so she was <laughs> saying this women, mm-hmm. they run in. That's interesting. And it's like, and what does a- that matter? Can I, somebody sure. please be on sure. you? What she was saying. Yeah, but I do feel as if, like, yeah, and if if we if you get the communication over the net, yeah, I mean, what do, does it matter? I'd see. I don't think it is, and I do think that Matter. isn't this lovely that we can have our own accents. I've always got my own accent now, and I, and sadly, and I again, I'll say maybe this is my shit. I think it's closed doors for me. The fact I speak the way I do, I really mm-hmm. do believe it. It's closed doors for but, me. But you know, and if you yeah. if you think about it, as the child's in primary school, and the Wayne's mommy, daddy, granny and granddads all say windy and the teacher's going, it's not windy, it's window, you're wrong. And all of a sudden, his whole, you know, his whole world is wrong. Family yeah. is wrong. His you whole know? system is wrong. Yeah, yeah. Then he is wrong. So, so it's shame-based. So then we get shamed because mm-hmm. we're not speaking the Queen's English. But I suppose what we're saying is unconscious bias is seeded up from our cultural family units, isn't it? So we, do, it is. we don't even know that we're... Like me, I didn't well, know I was a Celtic supporter. I didn't think I cared about but, you know, <laughs> but to admit that there's an unconscious bias between the Scottish and the English, that's no one-sided. There's an unconscious bias in the Scottish that people have said that we're this red-headed tartan. Everybody thinks you wear a kilt. Um, I know. You know, you're this red-headed, everybody drinks, they're all wild. If you come to Glasgow, you'll get slashed. So there's unconscious biases being placed upon us. And yeah. it's almost like when, when you start to really go into unconscious biases, it's got a foot in racism, it's got a foot in inequality. And we could be out and we could be fighting for equality, which is very difficult to get because we're all different, but we're fighting mm-hmm. for equality. Mm-hmm. 
but we've got an unconscious bias, which is actually where we're looking at inequality. It's that complete contrast yeah. within the system. And, you know, my, and there's my, a lot of half truths there masquerading as whole truths. Yes, you know, absolutely. There's a lot of, a lot of so why, I suppose, then, do you think we've got unconscious bias? You know, what, is that, where does that come from? Like, are we being like, lazy? Like, are we are we, are we're, not, we're not making our own mind up. Are we're we lazy? not valuing it. Question. We're not questioning it. It's back to that. We're not questioning that our, we're allowing authority, the authority of our parents. Or, well, I live in Lanark. I live in a small town and I can look at families who the boy supports Rangers, his dad supports Rangers, his grandfather supported Rangers and they all go in the Rangers bus together to go and see Rangers play. And they've inherited the beliefs of their grandparents and that the segregation. You know, my family, my granny, my grandmother uh, was from England. She was from Yorkshire. She married my grandfather, who was predominantly Scotland. His father, John, offered to pay her a large sum of money to go back to England. He never <laughs> saw my... So my grandson was my father. He never saw his grandson, uh, my father, until my father was three, and they lived 100 yards away from one another. Wow. That's terrible. He used, to, he used to shout at the bottom of the garden something along the lines of, you, you dirty sass and I get back mm. to England. And wow. Da 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 And then these are all unconscious biases that are but you know, set up in all our systems. It's, and it was it, only a generation ago. Sure. But you know one of the things, I, I, I mean, that, that's, a whole, that's a sad story. The word sass is quite interesting because it actually comes from northerner. I was watching Have I Got News For You one night a couple of years ago and uh, it's one of my favourite programmes and I was like, oh, great. And it was Ray Winston was the guy in the mm-hmm. middle, you know, the kind mm-hmm. of girl. So he spent the whole programme talking about the sweaty socks. At no point did he say the Scots. He actually only said the sweaty socks. It, there's a lot of laughter about it and all that kind of thing. And I sat and I thought, what's the put-down word that the Scots have for an Englishman? And can you think of one? You know, and it's that kind of thing of... You know, I have an Airbnb room, so I'll get a guy from London coming to stay in the Airbnb room. And one guy sat down and he said to me, why do the Scots hate the English? And I was like, we don't. I don't think they do. I really don't. I know. He says, well, what's all this independence stuff? And, and I was going... It's not about you, Tal. It's not about you. About you, you know. And, I, and I, was, I was kind of laughing and saying to him, you know, I think there's an unconscious bias there with you that, you know, there's this kind of um, way of being... And that stuff with the Glaswegian being violent, you know, every time somebody's came back for a day for the in time. Glasgow, I've gone, did you meet anyone who wanted to stab you? Yeah. And then, of course, the absolute opposite. They're going, folk are weird to you. They chat to you. They show you the way. They they take you the place you want to go. They, I mean, I don't think that's too romantic, uh, an idea of Glaswegians. I do. I've said it before. I'll say it again. It's a very sophisticated way to be, to be friendly to your strangers. It's funny because there's the whole thing, isn't there, with English people saying that Scots are mean. In my experience of the world, it's the complete opposite. And this was an actual story in an uncomfortable moment. Last week I was in London and I was sitting with people that I've only known virtually, but this was me. So I know them quite well. But And they were telling me some story. that It was a story that basically started with somebody getting their breakfast late in a cafe of poached eggs, taking them to the office with them, opening the box they had fell apart and taking them back to the cafe four hours later at lunchtime to get their money back. And I was laughing and I was saying that is the most English thing I have ever heard. Uh-huh. And I was sitting at a table surrounded by English people and surprise, surprise, of course they were offended by of me course. saying that's the most English thing See, I've ever seen. Uh-huh. And so I had to apologise. But genuinely, I can sit here with you and say, that's the most English thing well, I've ever know, heard. I, I tell you, see the, the Scots as, as minis, that really gets my goal. I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. I think the unconscious bias is such that if you finished off your thinking, what you're actually talking about is a gift of thrift. And the gift of thrift is a wonderful thing, you know, the make do, the mend, that it's a beautiful thing to fix a chair or, you know, put a, a leather patch on an elbow. It's a beautiful way to be the gift of thrift. But the idea of the Scots is mean, isn't he just coming from England? It's an international thing. You know, see if you go to Germany, that you would read in German supermarkets, you would read... Um, low price, great value, Scottish price. There's actually the lowest price you can get of a thing. It's called, in German, the Scottish price. So out there, there's this thing of the Scots as mean. But do you know what I think is really going on there, behind all of that unconscious bias? There's a gas sense... Lightness, the gas lightness. lightness. There's a sense in us Scots that you should not waste. You should not be someone who's reckless in a way 
where you take things for granted or you waste things. And I think that comes all the way for the Highland Clearances. It comes from a nation that has actually been in so many times of its life, you know, oppressed. So there's a, a great sense of taking care and, and, and enjoying stuff. And I think the gift of thrifts, loads of my girlfriends have... Uh, you know, had stalls in the barras and stalls in the square yard, and square, you know, and they're always excited about finding things that have got, you know, great material, beautiful stitching and stuff like that. And anybody could look at that and go, you buy everything second hand. You, you know, I think it's mean. It's not. See, um, a long time ago now, 2005, I was lucky enough to go and do the Anchor Trail in Peru, right? And it was like a charity thing. I worked in this sector and I I'd was going on that, that, right? So the doctor who was there was of Asian descent. It was from London, right? It was people all over the UK. And I remember the story that sort of I got everybody laughing together and having a bit of a, a joining when we all met at Heathrow Airport was when he'd got on the tube, he was from London, he'd got on the tube in London with his big backpack on, because we all had to obviously take a big backpack to go and trek through Peru. He'd cleared the carriage because this was not that long after 9-11. Oh. It was four years the other side yeah. of it. And he says, "If I never knew that all I needed to do to get a seat on the underground was wear a backpack and you know we were really yeah. laughing about it mm. but I suppose we were laughing about it his experience of that story I'm sure he must have had a bit of pain and hurt yeah. about that but it's that unconscious bias that can really like you know when yes. you're getting on a plane yes. or like when I'm getting on the, the underground even in Glasgow myself I always go in the carriage that the driver's in because I think that's the safer thing to do really? I always do I always do because <laughs> I think that's the safest thing to do and that's what I've said to my daughter to do so we've got all these unba- especially around travel haven't we? Yes. About what's safe and what's not yes yeah. I said to you I was hiking up in Ben Nevis on Saturday just passed and I noticed that no fault of their own I was an Indian family eh, walking towards me and I found myself holding my breath as I walked past them or wanting to step a few metres away from them. Why? Because I unconsciously believed they were carrying a Delta 5 variant. That was an unconscious bias. So is this the media, do you think, that's peddling this? Peddling our unconscious biases? Where does biases? this come from? Well, it comes well, from your, yeah. your house. It comes, it comes from the your image of what well. a terrorist looks like. The image of a terrorist. Oh, yeah, but yeah. Then. The image of what somebody carrying COVID looks like. And so we didn't make them up in our minds. Somebody put that image in our minds because... Of, Every image oh, is put in for mind. sure, we're all victims of that propaganda, that and that those horrible words that like swore them. And do you know one of the unconscious biases I've got is I get disappointed if I think folks should know better. So you know, I mean, I, I was talking to a bunch of boys, you know, beautiful looking young men, happened to be Asian, happened to be from the South Side, happened to be Glaswegian, happened to be from lots of money, and their conversation was all about migrants. There's a bit of me that thinks you should know better. Your dad was probably an, you know, you know your dad. Maybe your granddad was an immigrant. How come you? How come? And then I think, is this a scarcity thing? Is this, you know? And then I think Pretty Patel, you know, she's she's Indian descent. You know what? You know, is there something in there is about, about fear? your own self-loathing, your uh, own scarcity beliefs that you know I get away with? Oh no, wait a minute, I don't, I, I don't know. Is it fear when I go into a room with the the grey man and his grey suit, with his grey attitudes and his grey complexion? Aye, aye. Then is that fear because I'm thinking you're going to reject me now? Like my, that's who's what I've that just put, man on the radio. Uh-huh. Have I just put myself in a situation where I'm going to be rejected? So why am I sitting here? So ultimately, is it about fear? Am I scared? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably. Yeah. And we can't no mention racism in the gollywog that was on the side of the marmalade jar. I don't mean ever that thought... That was only a generation Listen, ago. Listen, I, I remember, you know, the Black and White Minstrel show and you could... That's right. just I remember, remember watching that. Go, what were we thinking? What were we thinking I mean, or no thinking? We weren't they thinking. It's, yeah. We were setting up a whole generation of people to be racist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we have those unconscious biases. I love the one Anne just said there. Yeah. You see an Asian man with a beard and a backpack and immediately he's a terrorist. Yeah. Immediately, in my head, he's a terrorist. There's an unconscious bias right there. I know. Obviously, we're three white people here, you know, but remember my dad saying to me, in America, the best and the worst things happen. So if you wanted a, you know, a black female judge, you're not going to find it in the UK. You're going to find it in America, you know? Mm-hmm. And of course, what he's basically saying is that the black female judge is going to be a fairer judge and of course, that's what I think. But is that an unconscious bias? You know, how do I know that that person does? Well, I think it's interesting as well with young people they, these days. One of the biases they call it the halo or horns effect, which is where you perceive somebody to be great because of some attribute that they have. And so it's like the whole social media thing, isn't it? She's got a million followers. I mean, my daughters will tell me somebody that like, they're watching Love Island and they're saying, ah, that's how many followers they've got on Instagram. Mm-hmm. 
So mm -hmm. all of a sudden they go up the peck order a wee bit mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of how many followers they've got on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they might not even be a nice person. Absolutely. And so it's like, how do we attribute or if, you know, if you said he works here or they work there or they've got that, mm -hmm. you, would, like, you would put a, sure. a, a value on them, wouldn't you? Yes. Well, well all, all, I mean, obviously celebrities get a lot to answer for. I mean, in my wee tiny experience of being somebody that folk would recognise on the street and go, oh my God, you're Gina out of River City. There was loads of projections and unconscious biases there. But as an actor in general, I remember saying to somebody once, well, I'm actually quite shy. And they were just going, oh, get out. Oh, you. I was going, no, no, they call acting the shy man's revenge. Have, have, you, have you never heard that? And they just thought this was ludicrous that I could possibly say mm -hmm. I was shy. And of course, my bottle crashes at any given moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you both know that. I have moments where I completely lose any confidence in myself, you know. But that projection of, oh my God, if you're somebody that folk are asking for your, for your autograph, you know. I mean, the idea that... I remember going to a personal development workshop once and it was all about the not okay feeling deep inside, the not enough feeling deep inside. And we had to share with the stranger next to us about how we tried to compensate to cover that up. You know, and one was going, well, I've got five degrees, and another one was going, well, I've got loads of plastic surgery. And I said to the woman next to me who didn't know me, I said, um, well... I'm in a soap opera and people ask me my autograph. And she went, oh, oh, well. And she basically went, oh, well, that'll do it then. Well, you've obviously cracked that not good enoughness. And I just looked at her and she looked at me and the next time we were hysterical. It's what we, what, what we always say. It's, it's, it's about connecting back in with ourselves, isn't it? It's about making ourselves innocent and... And seeing it, I think, and, and as your prop... Because, yeah. you know, we haven't, we haven't researched this. We're just emptying our heads and talking about what we think about and sharing our views and that's just our opinion. We're not saying we're right, we're just having a conversation mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's at school for me, 1983, 84, I'll never forget it, HIV hit the UK like a pandemic, like mm -hmm. COVID mm -hmm. and we had talks on it and all the rest of it. I then had an unconscious bias that HIV was only for gay men and then it became drug users. Yeah. Right, and it was like genuinely. I went through a period when I used to go into a club in Edinburgh that I used to wipe the rim of my glass with my shirt. Mm -hmm. Or if, like this pandemic, exactly the same as this COVID, I now have lots of gay friends that have no HIV, and HIV isn't going to jump off of them and land on me. Totally. I had this unconscious bias back in the eighties going into Edinburgh admitting that, I did go into Edinburgh for a night out in the 80s, um, <laughs> that if I stood next to a gay male man, I was going to end up contributing HIV. That was the madness. Mm -hmm. that the way that we had been educated, our sex education system around about HIV in schools were absolutely deplorable. And like this pandemic, only bred fear. Yeah. Right? How outcast did the gay community feel in the 80s? You know, People will probably not be able to comprehend what I'm saying to you now. Mm. Well, you're at school where there's LGBT rights and counsellors and communities and it's accepted. 30, 40 years ago, sure. gay people were outcasts. And along with that, if you were a homosexual, then you were interested in casual sex. You weren't interested in relationships. You know, you no. weren't interested in marriage. You weren't oh. I mean, thankfully, that's all shifting and changing oh. now. Not least because that's not just lost, gay on. men. Lots of people are just interested in casual relationships. Oh, no, 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 but you'd yeah, assume yeah. that they would especially not be uh, interested in marriage. Into, all, you know, if you're a gay, gay man, were into, were into wains. Gay men weren't they just gay. They were paedophiles. <laughs> all gay men were paedophiles. Oh dear, oh, God, that's true. But listen, while we're talking genders, we've, you know, we've got male and female here. You know, we we have to confess that idea of you know. Um, I've got masses of unconscious bias about who men are and what they think. Yep. And I, I remember as a kid watching The Quiet Man. It was my mummy's favourite film. Aye. But I remember mm -hmm. thinking that they must have to pay John Wayne a lot of money to kiss and be romantic and hug. Because, you know, she'd be into it, but he wouldn't be into that. You know, like he'd be like, men aren't into, into kissing. Women are. Women love hugging and kissing, but... Men have got other things to do, you know. You know, it's Funny, like, you think about the Janet John books, you know. She was in Making Scones. Janet was making Scones with Mum, but they were building a boat. Uh, you know, John was doing his stuff. I was remember thinking, I don't want to bake Scones. I want to build a boat. I want to be... Uh, right, you know, yes. Great like, conversation, you know, Libby. We've all been brought up with Brilliant. these kind of ideas of... I remember one time watching Sinbad with my da and um, the sailors had all crashed their ships because the sirens were singing in the rocks. And I must have been maybe eight or nine. 
and I was watching Sinbad with my dad and I said, oh, God, oh, because I wanted to build boats. Oh, these beautiful boats. Why are they crashing them on the rocks? What's going on? And my dad said, well, the women are singing. And I was like, right, are, are, are they bad singers? He was like, no. And I was like, right, so is it just putting them on? No, the idea that men were interested in women singing, the idea that there would be some allure that would distract the men from sailing their beautiful ships. I could not understand why a guy would be interested in a woman singing. What right. would be interesting about that for a guy? You know? You've got me thinking there with that, right? So I was thinking about this just the other day, funnily enough. I was um, I was studying over in America about 10 years ago, and one of, the, one of the things that I learned was how detrimental, how detrimental it was to the human brain to be trained out of being left-handed. So just bear with me. Bear with, these are just transient thoughts going through my head as we're having this discussion, right? I'll try and formulate them as best as I can. So if you're a left-handed child and that hand would have got tied behind your back. Now, if there's young people listening, that did happen. I'm no making this up. And that had a detrimental effect on the human organism's brain. If you're meant to be left-handed, you're meant to be left-handed. You're no meant to be trained to work with your right hand. That has a really bad effect in the brain. Now, I believe that we've been trained into thinking that men should be at the head of the table. I don't think that's real. I think that women should be in authority. I think women have got... And don't... don't hey, hold on. Let's not get into... We should be equal. Because men and women aren't equal. They're never going to be equal. They're not going to be equal because we're very different, right? And I think that women are the ones that birth our children. Women are the ones that should be in authority. And I think somewhere like the left-handed trained to be right, I think we've been trained into believing that men are supposed to be at the helm of the ship. And I think that's just as detrimental to our society because we've been led to believe something that's actually no accurate. It's a bit separation, isn't it? That we're always trying to separate ourselves yes. from each other. Yes. You are different from me and therefore I belong here and you belong there. But I suppose it's interesting to bring in the thought of, is it always negative to have an unconscious bias? You know, does it actually bring balance to us? You know, never judge a book by its cover, or do we actually need to a tiny bit of that to protect ourselves? Do we yeah, need to have an unconscious bias? Stuff. Like, I don't feel safe here, and therefore I must go. Yeah, yeah yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. And so even though it's based on unconscious yeah. bias, maybe yeah. it's protecting me sometimes as sure, well. Sure. I remember going to a butch lesbian party once with a pal, <laughs> and I was terrified of the women. What are you? <laughs> yeah, because there was some real violence going on in that room, and I, and I just was like oh no, this is like an archetypal, more macho than macho. In my head, all my pals who were feminist lesbians were, you know, had peppermint tea bags in their bags and, and, and like cats and stuff like that. All of a sudden I was with these girls and they had braces and bobber boots and, and there was a, a fight get out and it just terrified me. Ross, what you're saying about the, you know, matriarchal societies used to be the norm. Of course, Aye. because you could only prove lineage by actually watching a baby born. <laughs> you only go, that's definitely her way. Aye. So that was the safest way to make sure that the good genes were getting passed on. Whereas he could go, that's my way. <laughs> it wouldn't necessarily be. You know, so a matriarchal society is where the norm went. When did the patriarchy kind of get up, you know? There's a theory, I'll tell you this theory, which I think is really funny. The reason that men are in leadership roles all over the world, and they are, you know, the reason the patriarchy is alive and well and thriving is because when the two-year-old understands that not only are they not their mother, they're not even like their mother, if they're a two-year-old boy, that's really frightening. Whereas the female brain, the feminine brain, goes, oh my God, not only am I not, you know, when symbiosis, you know, when the baby realises I am not my mother and then my mother's not me, she could leave the room and I will be separate. Ah, that's when the terrible two starts, supposedly. So when symbiosis collapses and you now realise you are an individual, what baby girl goes is, OK, I'm not my mother, but at some level I know I'm like her. Whereas baby boy goes, oh, no, not only am I not... When I say mother, you know, the carer, you know, not only am I not like her, you know, she can leave the room without me. And that's when the boy goes, I need to be in control. I need Aye. to be... Don't know if that's true. Aye. But I have my unconscious biases about the fact that I think that men don't hurt the way we hurt 
which is a nonsense because that is that is a probably a nonsense, isn't it? I would say. Yeah. That we ridiculous. have ridiculous. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that we've designed that the you know men don't cry and men need to be strong and all that. And we've actually and it's not often I'm talking up for the men, I'll be honest with you. But we've actually we have we've gaslighted them as well. I feel as if it's my word, the new but we've gaslighted them as well into believing that they can show emotion and that that is yeah. very, very challenging and very destructive actually, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I don't know if you'd agree with, me with this, Ross, but I once I was working with a mindfulness teacher and he said to me that as a man who runs men's groups, what he understood was that every man he'd met at some level felt responsible for the bad stuff. And what he said was what women don't understand about men is that because in general it's quite often a male who's the guy that did the murder, did yes. the rape, did the... Yes, He said, every man I've ever met has a real sore, vulnerable space of course they are. inside him because he thinks, God, I'm the gender that did the bad stuff. Oh. It's all men that are rapists, it's all men that are paedophiles, it's all men that are murderers, but there are women that are paedophiles, there are women that have raped men and there are women that have murdered. Yeah. And we're carrying this unconscious guilt, if you like. But mm. it's also an unconscious bias that's then being created that men are bad, men are to be feared. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so where do we go to then? As we start well, to I, round this up, where do we go to? How do I, we start to I be aware of our unconscious bias and so let them it's awareness, mess it's awareness our lives as up. we're walking towards the Indian family coming down yeah. Nevis. Watch let's, my little brain go, I've got an unconscious bias that well, they've got Delta yeah. 5. Let's understand that what love would look like is if we lost some labels. Mm. So it's about the labels collapsing, you know. So when we talk about the sacred feminine, it can be in a man, it can be in a woman, it can be when we talk about, you know, the the, the the yeah. There's a kind of you know the divine spark that's about community and about you know that's one of the things that I think the Scots have this idea. The Scots are often accused unconscious bias of tall poppy syndrome. You know, the Scots go, "I can't your feather, I you don't get above <laughs> yourself and all that all that stuff." Well, actually, like like I, I think that's a there's something really beautiful in there because what it's saying basically is we need you on board. Don't get above yourself. This is a community that needs to look after each other. You know, we need to actually start collapsing the labels of male, female, you know, somebody that's only interested in this or only interested in that. You know, basically, you know, we're we're encouraging our girls to do anything now, do anything they want to do, you know. You know, anything you want to be, you can be, you know. You know that old joke about the story where it's lateral thinking where you say the, the man climbed the hill and, and he died and his wee son was taken off into the surgery and the surgeon runs in and goes, I can't operate on this boy, that's my son. And people go, wait, his dad died? But the surgeon said, and of course, it's a woman. You know, yeah. the surgeon's his mammy. You know, yeah. and you go, oh, God, I never thought of that. You know, yeah. so that's going to work less and less these days because women are becoming surgeons and pilots and, you know, and, you know, yeah. you know it used to and be... politicians. And politicians, you know. And so first ministers. Let's lose some labels here. Right. Let's start sharing our unconscious biases with each other and say, God, you know, make me wrong here. Tell me different, you know, uh -huh. give me insight, you know, you know, open my mind. And I think owning it as well, like owning own your, own your shit, you know, own the fact I actually had judged you before I even met yeah. you. And that's really something that's really rigging to me before I judge the man in the grey suit. Do you know, Anne? Don't judge the man totally. in the grey suit the grey hair. Everything. In the posh kind of everything, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the guy who said to me, "Who's that girl on the radio?" He ended up being quite a nice guy, really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well done, guys. Thank Good one. You. Good one. So, Thank you. see you next time. Thank you for listening to our program. You can find future episodes on Acast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. With thanks to Matt Ramsey for editing and mixing this episode. This podcast was produced by Solace Sounds. Mm -hmm.